My finance
for your patience. Um, we are pleased to say that we have quite a few people still in line uh, who are trying to come into the room. And so um, thanks again for your patience. We're just going to wait another five to more than 10 minutes. And I think we'll be able to clear everyone in and we will get started.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Eisenhower Institute and all of us here at Gettysburg College, it really is my pleasure to welcome you to our 22nd annual Blavitt Lecture. I'm Bob Giuliano, the president of the college, and I'd like to begin by thanking each and every one of you here in the ballroom, those of, who, those of you who are joining us remotely from across the country and around the world online, again, for joining in this truly special event. We have important work before us as a nation and as a society. And if we are to confront the challenges of today, it starts with a willingness to step forward. Students, as Gettysburgians, this means taking the consequential education you are receiving here and putting it to good use in your communities here and when you graduate in service to others and to the greater good. Your presence here this evening speaks powerfully to your willingness to make that commitment now and again in the future, and I am deeply grateful for that. Tonight, we are truly pleased and honored to welcome to our community, a welcome back to our community, I should say, a leader who has taken to heart President Lincoln's urging just a few miles from here to rise to the unfinished work of our time. Of course, I am speaking of our distinguished guest and friend, of the college, Maryland Governor Wes Moore. In a moment, I will turn the microphone over to Tracy and Josh to kick off our programming. But first, I would like to just take a moment to express our deepest thank and grat gratitude to the governor for joining us today, to strengthening the bonds that unite us as Americans, and for sharing his wisdom and insight with all of us. Thank you, Governor. And I believe there's no more fitting location than here to engage in the consequential work of our time. The history of Gettysburg College, of course, is deeply entwined with the events of 1863, events which tested our most fundamental values and indelibly shaped the course of this country. Today, our students live and learn on hallowed grounds. Union and Confederate forces swept through the heart of our campus on the first day of the battle. And in the aftermath, it was our alumnus, David Wills, who personally invited President Lincoln to come to say a few appropriate remarks at the dedication of our National Cemetery. It was here that Lincoln asked whether our nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created, created equal could long endure. And it was to us that he spoke of a new birth of freedom and called upon us to protect the government of the people by the people and for the people. And so we are, and so is the governor. Democracy is fragile. We see too vividly the ongoing consequences of polarization. We have a responsibility, indeed an obligation to do all we can now to bridge the divides and to come together as a nation. In witnessing our Gettysburg College students in action and the commitments they bring to this community, I remain confident that we can and that we are in good hands with the next generation. Again, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for attending our lecture this evening. I'd like to thank the governor for being with us and sharing his thoughts and wisdom. And now I will turn the microphone to my friend and colleague, Tracy Potts, the executive director of the Eisenhower Institute. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, and good evening, everyone. Bob has eloquently set the stage for why we're here tonight and importantly, for why this place matters uh, and why we are having this important conversation about our country's future at this moment in time. Now I'd like to take just a few brief moments to tell you about who we are. The Eisenhower Institute is an experiential learning program that connects aspiring young leaders, many of whom are here tonight, with public policy experts, not just to learn and not just to hear, but to do. We help them discover their passion and tackle society's most challenging issues. We are nonpartisan, inspired by President Eisenhower's approach 
of engaging diverse people and diverse ideas to find common ground and to take action. I spent my career as a journalist helping people understand how policies are made in, in town halls and places like Harrisburg and Annapolis and in our nation's capital and how those policies affect their lives. Two years ago, I came here to become an educator to help the next generation of young leaders influence those decisions, to help them find creative and innovative ways to make our world better. And I will tell you tonight, I love what I do. These young people inspire me every day. We are preparing them for a lifetime of service, to lead with integrity, to be responsible global citizens, and to inspire the world to meaningful action. And it's why we host events like the Blavitt Lecture. Since 1996, with the support of the Blavitt family, this lecture has brought to our campus individuals whose professional experiences provide first-hand perspectives on our American political system with a focus on public service based upon truth, justice, and civil discourse. Our speakers have included members of Congress, well-known writers, accomplished authors, talented educators, noted researchers, and leading political scientists. Tonight, we add to that list a man whose impressive credentials span from the classroom, to the battlefield, to the boardroom, and now to the statehouse. He's here tonight to harness those experiences into a vision that will guide our young leaders to become the change makers that we are counting on them to be. At this time, I'd like to welcome his friend and colleague, Josh Fiddler, to introduce tonight's speaker. Everybody. Amen. Within a few miles from where we gather tonight, eight score years ago to the month, 272 words delivered in two minutes, a great man of principle memorialized ordinary men who called to serve in an epic battle to preserve an idea. I am most anxious to hear another man of principle called to a life of service in fraught times characterize the state of our grand experiment in our time. Governor Wesley Watende Omari Moore was born in Maryland, was educated in Pennsylvania at Johns Hopkins and at Oxford. He has devoted his adult life to service in the 82nd Airborne as a White House fellow, as an entrepreneur wrestling with the graduation gap for underrepresented minorities, as the author of three best-selling books and a children's adaptation of one of them, as a host of a years-long radio program surfacing effective solutions to contemporary problems, in leading one of the nation's most innovative and rigorously empirical anti-poverty organizations, and against all odds, winning a race for governor in a field crowded with well-known politicians. We are this evening incredibly blessed to have the opportunity to hear from, to dialogue with, and to stand with Maryland's governor and this year's Blavitt lecturer, my friend in service, Governor Westmore. I'm so grateful for your friendship, brother. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for your family. I'm grateful for your heart and for your spirit. And uh, and it is an honor to uh, to be here and uh, and to, and to follow you always. Uh, I also want to say, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, this has been this is an absolute joy to be back here. Uh, you know, I had a, I was saying I had a chance to be here in 2014 when uh, when uh, Gettysburg made my book, The Other West More mandatory reading for all the students. So I'm glad y'all aren't here in the mandatory terms this time around. Uh, but it is an absolute joy to, uh, to be back to a place that, uh, 
that I don't just uh, I don't just admire, but I respect so so deeply. And so thank you so much, um, uh, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, you know, thank you not just for the invitation, but for how you continue to touch organizations in such a powerful way, and that it just continue to do so. And we are all grateful. Uh, and 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 also to to the Blavitt family, uh, we 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 cannot thank you all enough for your commitment to humanity and for your commitment to to uh, not just pushing us all to be better, but continuing to show us what better looks like. And so we're grateful for continuing to lift us all up. And and I'd say it's it's really nice to be back here um, because I do I, I did not study here, but I do have very fond memories of being here at Gettysburg, and it wasn't just in 2014 when I had a chance to, uh, to to speak here before, but also I think about my time as an undergraduate because we actually had a chance to play on football when I went to Johns Hopkins. <laughs> and, uh, and our senior year, we happened to win that game 54 to 13. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to see you guys again. <laughs> but I have to tell you too, um, during that game, I, I think I had a touchdown. Um, in fact, I know I did because I didn't have that many. <laughs> and so it was really good to get a chance to score one because uh, I, I really enjoyed my football career, but it wasn't like I was going to be inducted into the Maryland College Football Hall of Fame or anything. Um, but getting a chance to score a touchdown felt really, really good. Um, so I hope all is good between us. Um, I appreciate the invitation to be back. Uh, and I appreciate the chance to, to come here and speak. And, and when I got the call to be able to come here and speak and, and spend a little bit of time talking about an issue um, that I care deeply about, uh, and when they said, you know, you're coming to do a lecture, <laughs> first of all, that made me feel very fancy. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm giving a lecture. <laughs> um, but I do, and I did what everybody oftentimes commonly does when you're getting ready to give a fancy lecture or you're getting ready to do a big project or something very studious. Um, the first thing I did was I went to Wikipedia and I typed in my name. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was interesting because when I went to Wikipedia, and I actually hadn't done that, when I went to Wikipedia, I, I looked and, I, and it, in the first line, it just said, Wesley Watende Omari Moore is an American politician. And I was like, oh, hold on. <laughs> because I know how uncomfortable that made me feel reading that, right? I was like, as soon as I saw that as a politician, I was like, okay, we already have a problem here on our hands. Um, because I do work in politics and I'm very proud of being the governor of my state. But I also know that when people said to me, they're like, well, well what made you want to get into politics? Well, the first thing I always said was, I didn't, I wanted to be the governor. <laughs> because I felt like it was different. I felt like as governor, you actually had a chance to push on certain ideas and push on certain things. Um, and I also say that because I'm probably the most improbable governor that exists in this country, where I'm proud of the fact that I'm the governor of my state, but it's not lost on me at all, that I am the son of an immigrant single mother who did not get her first job that gave her benefits until I was 14 years old. And, you know, this is a woman who went on to earn a master's degree. So when we're having conversations about an equitable pay between men and women or an equitable pay between people of color and non, this is not an academic exercise to me. I don't need a white paper to explain it because I've seen this, that I am a governor of my state, but I'm also a person who felt handcuffs on my wrists when I was 11 years old because I grew up in neighborhoods that were over-policed and we knew it. That I am a governor who first joined the army when I was 17 years old. I was not old enough to sign the paperwork when I first joined the military. My mother had to sign the paperwork for me. <laughs> but I shall be the first one to tell you, um, after my teenage years, she was willing to sign whatever paperwork the army asked her to sign. <laughs> that I may, uh, I'm the governor of my state, but I'm also a graduate of a two-year college. That there was nothing about my journey that said that this is where he was destined to go. And that frankly, when I think about 
so much of my life and so much of my work. I'm also a person who believes and really believes in being able to get into this work because I wanted to try to fix these broken systems because I feel like in so many ways, my life has been a demonstration of them. I've seen these things. And so when people talk about this mistrust that people have in society, when people talk about a mistrust of systems, a mistrust of traditions, and they look around at policies, they look around at politics, and they see a Congress that's just seemingly inept to be able to get the basics done. When they can look around and, and they can see that you have individuals who are sitting in seats and who seem to be more interested in, you know, being cartoons on cable news than actually talking about real issues. When you see these things, I know this mistrust is real. And frankly, I know this mistrust is real, not just because I feel it. I know this mistrust is real because I have felt it. And in many ways, I still feel it. And that's why when I think about the mistrust, it really can lead you to do two different things. You can either curl up and you can scream at the system, or you can choose to actually do something to fix it. You can choose to actually do something to try to fix these ruptures that continue to leave actual human lives so broken. And so what I wanted to speak a little bit about tonight is the why I chose to actually work within the system to try to fix something that in many ways left me frustrated and left me as cynical as anybody else. And why when you come to that fork, I'm asking and urging for each and every one of you to do the same. Because you know, oftentimes when people talk about a generation or, you know, Gen Z, well, this is their, this is individual or it's lazy and it's cynical. That's just truthfully not what I see. I don't see that because when I think about this generation, I think that you all are the ones who are actually doing the work. You're just choosing to try to attempt to find ways of doing the work that's actually going to impact a lot of these things and actually try to fix the brokenness that you might feel. Because I think about it where, you know, it really is, I mean, it's Gen Z that you all are the ones who are on the front lines marching. On the front lines marching for racial justice and racial equity. That you're on the front lines urging not just our states and our cities, but our nation to actually put together policies that's gonna to help to save the planet so there's something actually worth saving. That you all the ones who are on the front lines protesting in front of Capitol Hill in front of the Supreme Court, saying that preserving a woman's rights to choose is actually important. That you've been the road warriors. You've been the ones who are urging us to be better. And so as part of that, I just think it's not that you all have given up on society. I think it's absolutely the opposite. I think there's a frustration with the systems and the institutions that make it up. And that's why working to actually fix them is important. Because I can tell you from my perspective, my journey into this, my first memories began with a failing system. Because I only have two memories. My first two memory, my first two memories that I have was once when I was messing with my sister. My mother only had she had you know had a, only a couple cardinal rules. One uh, was that you do not put your hands on women. And I had an older sister, and my older sister I have an older sister. My older sister is like six years older than me. My younger sister is like thirteen months younger than me. And me and my older sister used to get in fights. And one time, and every time my mother would see it, my mother was like, you know, you do not put your hands on women, you cannot put your hands on I explain her. And when my mother, and when I fight my older sister, I'd explain to my mother, I said, but mommy, that's not a woman. That's Nikki, that's different. <laughs> and my mother didn't tell me, told me there's no difference between the two. And I remember one time I was sitting there and my sister was blowing in my face and I told her to stop and she wouldn't stop and she got up and she ran away and I ran after her. And when I caught her, I, you know, I punched her in the arm. And as soon as I turned around, I saw my mom. <laughs> and I was like, well, this is about to get real bad, real quick. <laughs> and so my mother's running that to me and I'm running in the other direction. And it was my father that intervened. 
and he came into the room and he sat me down and he started explaining to me what I'd done so wrong and what my job is to always protect my family and never go after them, why my job is to always protect women, never put my hands on them. And then he told me I had to go apologize to my mother and to my sister. And the only other memory I have of him was about six months later when he died in front of me. And he died in front of me because he went to a hospital. And in search for help and in search of support, he was met with skepticism because his face was unshaven and his clothes were disheveled. And there was, they wondered if he had insurance. And when my mother arrived to the hospital, they asked her questions like, is your husband prone to exaggeration? And he was asked to leave the hospital with the instructions to go home and get some rest. And if it got worse, to come back. And then he went home and he died hours later. When my father went to the hospital looking for help. And he got sent away. So my first memories of our society was one where I and my family did not feel seen. Which I know oftentimes when that becomes your foundation, when that level of mistrust becomes what everything else is built off of, oftentimes that does lead to a real measure of anger and fear, which frankly it showed itself in a lot of my behavior. But then as I thought about this evolution, I thought about this journey, this idea of how do we then use this time to take a moment to break the false promises? How do we take a moment to actually set off what is a strong idea and a strong ideal and then turn it into something that everybody then sees and feels their place in terms of a larger system and a large society, that the intent was that it was built for them, but the practice has not always been the case. And so as Josh pointed out, that's how I then decided to focus my time. And whether it was running a company and starting a platform that was helping first generation students help make it to and through college, or whether it was running one of the largest poverty fighting organizations in this country, or whether it was leading soldiers in Afghanistan, or whether it was working in the State Department as a White House fellow. The thing I try to remember always, though, is no matter what system that I was working in, don't forget your past. And don't forget why you got into this work in the first place. Don't forget about the work that needs to be done and do not forget the work that you have to do, because if you never forget who you're fighting for, you will never stop fighting. If you never forget the work, the work will never tire you. And so as we've gone through this process, I found myself that as we get into every room that we are in, our job is not to just be happy to be there. Your job is to make sure that in every room that you go in, that you can redefine it. To understand that your job is not to come in and to simply be part of a system. Your job is to come in and to make that system better. And your job is to understand the structural challenges that still very much exist. You know, I remember when I was running Robin Hood and people would say to me, they're like, well, you know, poverty is a choice. And I'd say, you know what, I agree with you. But poverty is not the choice of the individual who feels the weight of poverty that sits on their shoulders. No one wakes up in the morning and is like, yeah, this poverty thing is cool. I'm not liking this. Nobody. It's society's choice. It's society's choice of asking us how much pain are we willing to endure in our neighbors before it breaks our heart just enough that we must do something about it. And all the issues that we were working on, you had to realize that there had to deal with a measure of systemic breakage that they were then addressing. The reason that we were the largest funder when it comes to housing insecurity is because there were far too many people who were left housing insecure. The reason that we were one of the largest funders when it came to food insecurity and making sure that people had proper nutrition and an opportunity to make sure that children, if they are not fed and they, they do not have nutritious meals, then they are not going to learn. 
And the reason that we ended up becoming one of the largest funders for food insecurity was because there were far too many people who were food insecure. The reason that we did that work is because we oftentimes would find ourselves trying to clean up that debris that comes from the broken systems. And eventually, I just became tired of cleaning up the debris. My faith in the power of fixing our institutions does not come from a blind optimism. It does not come because it just feels good. It comes because we have a deep knowledge of the mistakes that we have made, and we have a deep understanding on how to fix it. The question we then need to summon is do we have a larger will? You know, I oftentimes when people have told me that, you know, it's that some of the things that we're talking about, some things we're doing are unrealistic. You know, I say, uh, I'm often reminded that I'm the youngest Democratic governor inside the country. And it's often a lot of people who say that to remind me to slow down and to take our time. But if there's anything that our history teaches us, it's that the only way that things improve is when the younger generation pushes us to move. When the younger generation says, it's time to get going. And that's exactly what we see here. Because in so many ways, our country owes its greatness to young people who are entering the fray to change the world that they have inherited, but who are determined to make sure that they are going to leave it better. The man behind the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act joined the Texas legislature at the age of 29. The Speaker of the House who signed the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote began his career in Massachusetts government at 28. The author of the Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Board took his first job as a legislative aide in the California Assembly at 27. And that's exactly the kind of urgency that we need here to this day. That oftentimes you will be told that there are certain checkoffs that you need to make before you can go change the world. Certain degrees, certain credentials, how many letters after your last name. You don't need it. You just simply need the urgency to move now. You need to find the ability to make, to find that thing that makes your heart beat just a little bit faster and then decide you no longer want it to break like that. And that you can build a kind of coalition that can go get it done. This is the kind of opportunity that you all have here. This is the kind of opportunity that this college is going to produce. This is the kind of motivation, this is the kind of education, and frankly, this is the kind of example because you do not need to look much further than this campus to see how the world changed just in this locale. For people who were willing to not just hope to do better, but people who understood that you had to put in the work, or as the good book says, faith without work is dead. That you had to have people who were willing to put in the work. We do not just appreciate your generation. We fundamentally need you. And we fundamentally need you to use your time and use your talents to be able to make us better and to fix what's broken. That's the beauty and the pain of our democracy. In the wrong hands, we'll fail. In the wrong hands, it'll break. And in the right hands, we'll thrive. So my call to action today to you is more than a philosophical exercise. It is rooted in the things that I have seen in my first 10 months as governor of our state. Because we took office saying that we were not going to subscribe to the old ways of doing things. We took office saying we were not going to give in to the binary politics that if some win, that means others must lose by definition. 
And the only way you can get things done is by moving slowly. Or as the old African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Well, we decided that we were just going to go fast and far. We're going to create our own proverb. And we're going to do it because that's exactly what the time required. That when people said that you somehow have to choose between supporting workers and supporting businesses, we said, no, you don't. And this became an opportunity where just in our first months, we were able to say, yes, we were going to make sure that we were going to raise a minimum wage to $15 because gone should be the days when you have people who are working jobs and in some cases, multiple jobs and still living at or below a poverty line. And you can also reduce regulatory red tape for our businesses to be able to grow and thrive. And we don't have to choose between those two. And it's why we're very proud of the fact that right now I can tell you that the state of Maryland, and y'all are doing pretty well too, but the state of Maryland now has the lowest unemployment rate in the entire country because we decided not to choose. That we decided and said that, yes, we believe and we understand what the Supreme Court says, but I tell you here in Maryland, we are going to make sure that we are going to protect reproductive rights. And that's why just in our first 10 months, we were able to secure and make sure that not only were we going to enhance laws that focus on privacy and protection for both patients and providers, but next year we've now put our state on pace where next year we are going to codify abortion rights in our state's constitution because we're not choosing. That we said, yes, we believe that people have individual rights to protect themselves. But you know what? That does not include allowing someone who has a history of mental illness and a history of violence to be able to purchase a firearm. That it's saying that, yes, we believe that individuals have the rights and understanding of their Second Amendment rights, but that does not mean that anyone should be able to walk into a nursery with a gun or an amusement park or a government building that we said yes in order for all of our society to grow. It meant that we also need to make sure that we're making our society a cleaner and a greener place to be. A place where we actually can protect our environment and protect businesses and we do not have to choose. And by the way, it's a place that we introduce 10 pieces of legislation in our first legislative session. And not only did we go 10 for 10 on all of our bills, we went 10 for 10 bipartisan with both Democrat and Republican support on every single bill that we introduced and every single bill that we passed. You don't have to choose. If you're willing to go in and do the work and protect and preserve democracy, then we can do it. And yes, we made Maryland now the first state in this country that has a service year option for all of our high school graduates. For all of our high school grads, for all of our high school grads now have a chance to serve the state of Maryland. And they can choose however they want to do it. They can serve in the environment. They can serve in returning citizens. They can serve veterans. They can serve in education. It is completely their choice. We are simply asking them to find that thing that makes their heart beat a little bit faster. And by giving them a paid year of service and the option of having a paid year of service, we did three things all at once. The first was I'm a big believer in experiential learning. Give people a pathway to find what they want to do and give them an opportunity to do it. The second reason is I'm a big believer in an earned financial cushion, and especially for young people between the ages of 18 and 25. I know that earned financial cushion means something. I was there. And so if you give people an opportunity to earn something they can use and utilize however they want, why not? And the third reason is this, in this time of this political divisiveness, in this time of this political vitriol, in this time when we seem to be more concerned about where an idea came from, than is it a good idea? In this time when we're watching people literally scream back and forth to the point that we don't understand what either one of them is saying, we believe deeply that service will save us. Service will save us. That service is sticky. And that those who serve together are oftentimes the ones who will stay together. That instead of screaming at our institutions, 
We've chosen to fix them. Instead of complaining about their brokenness, we've decided to move our energy and actually making them a little less broken and make them work for more people. If we give up on our institutions, if we allow them to keep breaking, if we allow the naysayers and the ones who say, well, the Supreme Court is corrupt and media is fake and government doesn't work and higher education makes no sense. If we continue to allow the naysayers to control the conversation, then we will continue to watch ourselves spiral. If we continue to allow them to dominate, then we will continue to be divided. If we give up on our institutions, all of us will be stuck in a basic cycle of just trying to clean up the debris that comes from these broken systems. And I don't know about you, but that is not how I choose to live. And that's not how I'm choosing to spend my time. But I also know this, just because we choose to serve, it doesn't mean we give up on our morals or our values, or even frankly, our mistrust of the system. Because one thing I've learned is this, public service and skepticism should still go hand in hand. <laughs> they always have, they always will, and frankly, they always should. Even when you're in this seat, that does not mean you give up your skepticism. Because that's what's going to keep you going. No one means that by joining a system that you walk blindly into it. It means that same passion, that same fire, and that same frustration should be the thing that dominates how you continue to live your life. And it's the way that it always has. You think about it, it's this case of, of, of a Senator Bobby Kennedy, a belief in public service and a belief in skepticism, where Senator Bobby, Bobby Kennedy then calls for an end to the conflict of Vietnam, even if it meant defying a president from his own party. That you move with both. It's Justice Sonia Sotomayor taking a stand against her colleagues who would rather strip a woman of the right to choose than honor a court precedent. It's Congressman John Lewis who urged us to get into good trouble. Believing in public service and still keeping a sense of healthy skepticism is not a battle, it's an understanding. It's not a conflict, it's maintaining your courage and your commitment because our greatest leaders have questioned the systems that they have chosen to work within. And that's what made them our greatest leaders. Our greatest leaders have remembered that your hope and your skepticism do not have to be in conflict, that skepticism should always be your companion, it just doesn't have to be your conqueror. That keeping that skepticism is strong, but constantly battling the thing that is giving you that sense of skepticism is going to be your test. And that is the true nature of American patriotism. Because American patriotism is not about waving a flag. Loving your country does not mean lying about it. Loving your country means understanding its history and the things that need to be fixed and being able to put in the work to go ahead and fix them. <laughs> Loving your country means understanding that our nation has had flaws and still has flaws. But it also means loving your country enough to know that it's still worth fighting for. And that you cannot claim that you love this country when you hate half of the people in it. It's understanding that our nation can and should do big things. 
and being unafraid to be the leaders who are going to help it do it. Knowing that at times you might take positions that are not popular. Knowing at times it means that you will have to build a coalition that it might just be you staying there first. <laughs> but that you won't be by yourself for long. But it's knowing that sometimes leadership is remarkably lonely. But you know it's also lonely at the end of the day? Being ineffective. That you have a chance to lead with a sense of courageousness that people will remember for generations to come. But that becomes a choice. That holding on to your beliefs even as you continue to rise, that becomes a choice. That once you get into the seats that you will eventually will that you aspire to, that you never forget why you were there in the first place, that becomes your choice. Change these systems. Just don't let the systems change you. You know, I remember when I first got involved in politics, I had a conversation with my team. And I said to them, I said, listen, I have no problem spending all day long introducing myself to people who don't know me. I will not spend a single second of the day reintroducing myself to people who do. Never forget who you are. Never forget why you do this. You are going to leave this institution with not just remarkable credentials, but remarkable confidence. Because you are going to be a graduate of Gettysburg, I can tell you right now, people will take meetings with you simply because you asked for them. People will take what you say seriously simply because you said it. You have earned a measure of credential that is not just important, but that is potent. Use that credential wisely. And never forget your history. And I'll close with this. I remember how when I told you that my first memory I had of my father was him dying in front of me. The next memory I had after that was of a community that saved us. That when things were most bleak, when my mother instantaneously and frankly in a very unprepared way now realized that she was now going to be a widow with three children that she was going to raise on her own. It was a community church who were the first ones to reach out to her. And here's the thing about it. It wasn't our church. It wasn't even our religion or denomination. It was a seven day Adventist church that was up the street who heard about a tragedy that happened to a family down the street. My mother had never stepped foot in that church. Neither did my father. But one day when the doorbell rings, it was members of the church who heard about what happened and who came to not only provide food and solace, but also to stand with my mother and pray with her. That when one system failed, another came in to rebuild. That when one system made a family feel unseen, it was another system that came in and reminded them how loved they were. I still waver sometimes between a faith and a mistrust of all of our systems. I always will. And that's okay. But the thing that I know is this, on the short time that we have on this earth, we're gonna use our time to make it matter that we are ever here in the first place. And the thing that I would ask of each and every one of you who might be walking in with that sense of mistrust, who might be walking in and feeling like there's a measure of brokenness. And frankly, every time you turn on the television or every time you turn on a radio, you get reminded of it. I'll just simply ask you this, that there's two responses we can take to that. We can add to the echoing chamber or we can silence it. We can scream into the wind 
or we can figure out a way of actually changing the temperature. I would hope that for each and every one of you, for all of you in this generation, for all of you in this college, you do not need permission to change the world. You don't need permission to be bold. Your permission's already been granted. The thing that we ask though, is in this time, find those systems that need fixing. Go be in charge of them and go fix them because we're ready for you to do it. So bless you guys. Thank you for all you continue to do. Thank you for having me back here on campus. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you more and more and for this conversation we're about to have. So bless you guys. Thank you. Uh, there is a QR code here and also on your seat. Uh, and if you're, if you're not an electronic person, you're like, where's the paper, where's the bed? There should also be a card on your seat for you to send questions. But this is, this is a, a conversation that I think we need to have here in Pennsylvania, a conversation we're having in Maryland and really all over the country. So please, and, and I will put Van just to the assignment. We've already got a couple questions. I love it. I love it. We, we absolutely do. Um, and, and one person really wanted to know about uh, the service year program. You talked a little bit about that. I actually was there. I'm glad somebody sent the question in. Thank you, because I wanted to ask about that. Um, you talked about it, but how, how do we expand this? Like, what, what's your vision for what that looks like? You just launched it yeah. in Maryland, and what could this mean for the nation? Yeah, you know, I, I gotta tell you, I'm so happy about this. And you know what's crazy is that we were campaigning on this for two years. Like two years, we said there's no that service is going to save us, and that we are going to be a sacred service. And when we came on board, you know, I literally said, I mean, I said it during my inaugural address. I said it during the first state of the state address, and we said we're going to make this happen and get this done. And people are like, no, this is wonderful, and probably in your second term. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're telling you to kind of slow down. It's all good. And I was like, no, I hear you. And I think on day two, I signed an executive order. And by the way, one of the great things about being governor is to sign executive orders. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I signed an executive order creating the Department of Service and Civic Innovation that now this place is housed in. That in our first legislative session, we passed something called the CERB Act, which created the service year option. And now, yeah, just about a week ago, we just launched our inaugural class. And so now Maryland is the first state in the country that all of our high school graduates have a chance to serve our state. And so, and, and so, and one of the things we loved about it, and we really wanted to build out in the way I think it can scale, is this is an idea, frankly, it's not like this is new, right? We have organizations that have done this. We have organizations that frame it out. What happened in Maryland now is this is the first time it's been done at this kind of scale. This is the first time a state says, this is going to be the state that serves. That for all of our young people are gonna have a chance to be able to serve our communities. And I tell you, it's funny because I know I saw this example when I was in Afghanistan, when I came back and I ran for governor. I had people who I served in the military who came and campaigned for me. Many of them were not Marylanders. Many of them were not Democrats. They just literally came down when they heard I was running for governor and volunteer to door knock on my behalf. And they would go knock on doors and they would tell people, you know, let me tell you about the guy that I serve with. Because service is sick. And so while we're really proud of the fact that just in our first months, we were able to get this massive project done, once again, showing that in our state, like Maryland, we do big things. And we're unafraid to do big things. And not only did we get it done, Maryland is now the first state in this country to make this happen. But I can guarantee you this, it will not be the last. Because we already have other governors that are calling us up saying, so not that service shit thing you guys are doing. And I love it because we we plan on being a model that the rest of the country is gonna follow. 
you, you talked about a, a, a vision for how we can do what, what you've really demonstrated, what you've done, which is pull from your authentic experience uh, as a reason to, to, to motivate how you approach um, the work that you do and how we can each, each do that. Um, we spent a lot of time here at the Eisenhower Institute at the college talking about civility mm -hmm. and civil discourse. What what does that look like in this world today? We we actually have a few questions about that. Um, how how can we engage with each other civilly in a nation that is so divided, where people have such different ideas? You talked about patriotism. You talked about loving our country, um, but people's authentic experiences are really different. Yeah. And how do we have that conversation in a civil way and in a productive way? I, I think we have to we have to be willing to provide space and grace for people you know you know and, and that's the only thing that i ask when when i know that i'm having conversations with people is just provide me space and grace to learn to grow to get some things right to get some things wrong but to grow from it but i think it means you have to be willing to actually go and have those conversations actually one of the biggest problems we're facing right now is people just don't know each other and they're perfectly fine just like sitting in their corners and sitting in, sitting in their echo chambers and, and, and the news sources we choose or whatever like that, it's not looking to educate you. It's looking to validate you. And there's something really dangerous about that, right? And so I think that's why we've been actually, so we were very intentional um, in being able to say, we want to go out and see everybody. I mean, there were times we were on the campaign trail and we'd go out and we spent, you know, and still do spend an enormous amount of time in Western Maryland, and the eastern shore and all this kind of stuff i remember i remember what the first trip that we made as, as governor was out to a place called lola Coney, which is over in western maryland and i like they were having a they were having a uh, a water crisis so they had a full water advisory so i went out there to go help and i saw the mayor a guy named uh mayor coburn who's become a friend and he said to me governor he said do me a favor turn 360 degrees so I'm turning 306 degrees. He says, here's the only guarantee I can tell you. You didn't see a Democrat in five miles of anywhere you just went. <laughs> but he said, but he said, he said, but I tell you what, he said, you're the first governor that's been here since 1996. 96. If you are not willing to engage, you're not willing to learn. And you have to be willing to provide people the same space and grace that you're hoping that they will provide you. My interpretation of the world, just like everybody, comes from my history. It comes from my understanding. It comes from my learnings, both my academic learnings and also my personal learnings. That's what shaped me. That's what molded me. That's what created me. So that's my inclination. That's my understanding. I also appreciate that's mine. That your approach is gonna come from a different place. And that's beautiful. The same space and grace that I'm asking you to give me when I'm explaining where I am on an issue or why I believe on this issue is the same space and grace that I'm willing to afford you. If we can do that, then I think we will get to a point that, you know, and again, I tell people all the time, I'm not gonna agree with you on everything. You're not gonna agree with me on everything, that's fine. The thing that I ask is this, if we, if we disagree on Monday, can we please come back on Tuesday and have another conversation about what we might be able to get done on Tuesday? It's the only thing I'm asking. And I think that is why I think we've been able to move with a different type of approach and a different type of temperature. And frankly, it's the reason I think we've been able to get a lot of big things done very quickly in our state and why that's just what we're going to continue doing because we're just choosing to move together to get this done. That actually sounds like maybe a lesson from your military service. We have several questions here about that. Um, you know, when, when you're in combat, you are, you know, it's not political, right? You don't have the same background as, you know, you're not asking if people are Democrats or Republicans and Fox holes. Um, how is your military service um, really fed into the, the vision that you have and that approach that you have? And Part B, we have quite a few questions about that. Um, what do you see as our biggest threat to national security right now? Um, 
So first, both great questions. Um, so first on, on military, absolutely. And, and I remember having a conversation with someone in, in Baltimore County and I was explaining my economic policy. And he said to me, so I really like what you're saying. He's like, I tell you, he's like, I'm, I'm on the other side. I was like, what does that mean? And he said, it just means I'm Republican. And I said to him, I said, do you know a question I never once asked my soldiers? What's your political party? It never came up, right? I mean, like that, that conversation literally never came up. And it's a good thing it didn't, right? Because it was completely unnecessary. And, in, and completely inconsequential. Because they just needed to know, am I willing to fight for the person to my left and to my right? And I need to know, is this person willing to do the same? That's, that's, that's the guy, right? That's the guy. And, and, I, and I think this political back and forth that we just continue to, to resign ourselves to, um, it's a creation that has become really destructive in the way that our conversations take place. And so I did learn a lot from my time in, in the military where it just exposed me to people I just would have never been exposed to. It exposed me to parts of the country I would have never been exposed to. Like, trust me, had not been for the military, I would probably would not be spending a whole lot of time in, in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, or Fort Benning, Georgia, or Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Or, not that they weren't beautiful places. Um, <laughs> great training in Fort Bragg. I don't know what else it is. Um, but, it gave me a chance to experience things that I had never experienced before. And it gave me a different type of approach about how I view people, locations, areas, et cetera. Um, but I think the thing that the military also really gave me more than anything else, and people say, it's great, you know, you've got discipline, they woke you up early, you did push-ups. So I was like, that was bad. I mean, I mean, yes, you did that. You did push-ups. You woke that up. was the easy part? That was bad. <laughs> it, it turned out to be the easy part. Because I think the thing that I got most from the military was actually how it was the leadership training. And it was how to lead in some really complicated environments and how to lead people from maybe some complicated backgrounds where you know they put you in charge of something very specifically and it starts small and this graduated sense of responsibility that eventually becomes addictive and they're really good at that um and that's actually where i think about what is our greatest our greatest threat that we continue to face now um i really don't think it's some external force I know people can have a debate about what does it mean with the battle that we're having to I cite, you know, I, I studied, you know, my, did my master's in international relations. I said at great international relations and economics. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I really am, am not just a, uh, uh, you know, I focus a lot of time focusing on our international policies and that kind of thing. And now I see a lot how it directly impacts us in Maryland because we're such a diverse state. So people can have a debate about what is the race for China mean? What if people can have a debate about, you know, what is the future of, of, of AI and technologies? People can have a conversation about Iran. People can have a conversation about a whole bunch of stuff. The greatest threat we have is things like, it took us weeks to figure out who a speaker of the house was going to be. <laughs> right? The greatest threat that we have is that I'm spending my time right now. Right now, I'm spending hours of my day meeting with my cabinet secretaries, preparing for a government shutdown. Why am I spending my time on that? And why are my cabinet secretaries spending their time on that? Now we have to do it because we're going to make sure that our people are good. But that's when we talk about what are our greatest threats, it's the fact that we can't get, we have to be able to get basic things done and be able to speak with a measure of civility and to understand that, again, I, I really like my African Proverbs, but let's go back to another one. You know, the idea that. You know, the old, the old expression that, that you know, when the elephants fight, the only thing that dies is the grass, right? And for people to remember whose lives are being impacted when we're not able to take care of the people's business because we're taking, because we're spending more time on our, on conditions. So and where's so the disconnect? Why can that happen? You know, you talked about uh, bipartisan support for some of your measures. Why can that happen in Annapolis and it's not happening? <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't on the list. <laughs> no, that's a great question. Um, you know, one is is I um I, I I think being able to have and come with that spirit, it's it's a choice, and I think you have to really work at it. I think we've chosen to really work at this, and I think we're not going to stop working at it. And once you build up that sense of trust and that sense of confidence, you know, it is it's it it is the ability for us to then be able to have uncommon coalitions and uncommon conversations because people know at the end of the day they're going to be seen and felt and heard um 
I, I, I mean, I, I'll be honest. I, I do think there is a there is a challenge that a lot of the news dynamics and cable news dynamics and social media dynamics that they've continued to exhibit um, because you can watch how federal people can leverage them in a way that state and local cannot. Like state and local, our state senators and our delegates, they, they're not going to hop on MSNBC or Fox News, right? No one's going to watch that. No one's going to book them. And so there's a different capability they have of saying, the more bombastic I am, the more clicks and likes I will get, and therefore the more popular my name, the higher my name recognition goes, and therefore the more donations I get. So there is this perverse incentive that I think some of these networks are creating about where it's just like a notice me culture, because that builds up notoriety. Um, and I think that's very dangerous in a way that again, state and local officials can't really leverage, leverage it in the same way. Um, which makes the work of getting the job done easier because it means you actually have to cooperate. Where I think in some circles on the federal side, you can choose to isolate yourself and you can still win re-election. That becomes much more complicated on state and local levels. So let's talk about cooperating and, and getting the job done in Maryland. What issues existing before you were elected have been the most difficult for you to correct during the term so far and why? I um one of the most frustrating things for me about the job has been uh I have spent far too much time already dealing with two words guns and violence. This gun issue is insane. And just the ability for people to get their hands on them, the ability for these illegal guns to just flow into neighborhoods the lack of conflict resolution. And so things that used to be fist fights or, you know, I'm gonna see this dude outside and I got, him. it's turning deadly. Um, I have, I have been to far too many funerals already to be a governor who's been an officer for 10 months. And, um, and I've always said, I refuse, absolutely refuse for my time as governor to be dominated by simply going to funerals and offering thoughts and prayers and not passing a single piece of legislation. We have taken an all out assault on getting these illegal guns out of our communities, of banning these ghost guns, these guns that people are literally using 3D printers for and flooding communities with them, especially when you consider the fact like in Baltimore City. 65% of the guns that are recovered in Baltimore City, it's not that they don't come from Baltimore. They're not coming from Maryland. They're getting traffic. That we have said, yes, you know, we 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 think you know it's important to pass common sense gun legislation that says things like, again, if you have a long history of mental illness and a long history of violence, you should not be able to purchase a firearm. It's common sense. And it's the kind of common sense that we would want for all of our neighborhoods and all of our communities. It's so simple, but so difficult to enact. And so, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, um, you can influence and you can push and you can sign a bill when that comes to your desk. Yeah. Do you have confidence that the legislature that you're currently working with will help get I, some things done yeah i i do and and the, the good thing is is that we're already starting to see the results right i mean maryland so for example the state of maryland we we have gone over the past eight years in maryland we've seen the homicide rate in the state of maryland double in eight years we've seen the non-fatal shooting rate double in eight years baltimore city has gone eight straight years of 300 plus homicides in baltimore city but if you look at the fact that we have been so aggressive on this issue and again, that both includes dealing with the issues of illegal guns flooding in the neighborhoods, but that also deals with me doing things like making record investments in our education system, uh, in our apprenticeship programs and trade programs, providing employment opportunities, making all out assault on child poverty. Like we understand with both hands, being able to make investments in technology and, and information sharing and cameras and all that kind of stuff right now, despite watching trends moving in the wrong direction, a lot of other major jurisdictions in our in our country right now, 
homicides rates in, in, the, in, the, in the state of Maryland, down. Non-fatal shooting rates in the state of Maryland, down. The homicide rate in the state of, in, in the city of Baltimore, down 20%. This is gonna be the first year, and mark my word, in, in, in uh, hella high water, this is gonna be the first time uh, in eight and nine years that we are going to see Baltimore not hit 300 homicides and we plan on not gonna get close, right? But that takes intentionality. It takes focus. It takes cooperation. It takes working with local law enforcement. It takes making sure there's more opportunities for your young people. And we know that we've made progress. I know that we have not made enough yet. We still have a whole lot more, more work to do because I, I am not going to settle on this issue. And I'm not gonna settle as long as I'm sitting in the seat. But that is one issue where um, the amount of attention that we have spent towards those two words, guns and violence in our community is, um, it's staggering. And, and it's, it's a complicated issue, right? Because one of the leading causes of gun death is suicide. And so then you have issues of mental health. How How is your administration of that? Well, you know, it's, it's why I mean, 70% of all 911 calls actually have a form of mental health component to it, right? So mental or behavioral health. Um, and even when you're looking at a lot of these things like what's happening with behavioral health, overdoses, et cetera, uh, a lot of those things have mental health components to it because oftentimes there's all the trauma and trauma informed care because you see a lot of the people who are then choosing to self medicate to be able to deal with trauma, pain, et cetera. Um, the way we've chosen to do it is kind of a, it's a few different folks. One is we have made record investments in behavioral and mental health. And that both includes behavioral and mental health institutions, but then also training. Training support for students, training support for our trainers, making sure that there's more behavioral and mental health supports that are there than going around. The other thing that we decided to do is um, try to treat behavioral health as less of a criminal justice issue. Because the largest provider for behavioral health supports in our country are the prisons. That's the largest provider that we have in our country, the largest provider we have in our states for this. And so doing things like investment, investing in things like the CITs, the, the crisis intervention team, where these calls come in and they're able to then distinguish, is this something that requires law enforcement? Is this something that requires police? Or is it something that requires a crisis intervention team? Is it something that requires someone who actually understands the situation and because oftentimes we know that, that the entry of police into all situations can at times lead to an escalation of the situation. And that's frankly an unfair position to put your law enforcement in, where now you're asking law enforcement to do everything. So if you can actually come up with a better way of distinguishing between who should be the right and the responsible person to respond to individual crises and individual challenges, then you can both do a better job of treating and dealing with the issue and at the same time, uh, making sure that you're putting your, your, your first responders and your uh, and your law enforcement officers in, in a better position to be successful. Because frankly, if you're not, I don't see how that is any way being fair to the people who are choosing to put their lives on the line to be able to support the communities that they are, that they're sworn to serve. I think we've got time for three or two or three more questions. Um, we have almost 50. I mean, I don't know how long you can stay. I love it. <laughs> so let's, let's this script a minute and talk about redistricting um and, and a lot of that happened before you came into office and you talked about flawed systems um looking at the map in maryland right now do you think it's still a flawed system and, and what needs to be done it's so flawed i mean like you know and, and, and no what do you really think because <laughs> i'll be mean, like listen we, we go through the census the census process you know every every 10 years right and and so and and that's really how people distinguish between what are congressional district lines? Why that becomes so important is because uh, allocation is based on census tracts, right? So they'll look at census tracts and determine which jurisdictions get which financial benefits and which get with both federal and state supports, depending on your zip codes and census tracts. We already know it's a very difficult process to make sure that people are counted. The census process and the census tract process that we have right now, you have a lot of people and a lot of communities that are undercounted. And so you have people who live in certain census tracts, which are not getting the right kind of representation. The second, or right kind of financial representation. The second piece is it absolutely forces people into these corners. 
And so you then have, you know, the amount of competitive congressional seats that we have in our country is pretty minimal. You know, I can tell you, I'm just being very honest. Do you know how many, do you know how many truly competitive congressional seats we have in the state of Maryland? Truly competitive. One, maybe, maybe you can argue two. But with the exception of those, if something happens in the first district, right? The chances of a Democrat winning in the first district in Maryland are down. I shouldn't say no, because the first, last person put up a good fight, but I think she put up a really good fight, and I think she lost by 12, right? And she put up, she ran a very good race. If you're a, if you're a Republican, do you think you're ever gonna win a third congressional district in Maryland? I mean, I don't see the problem put up, I don't even know who would run. Right, so so we do have a gerrymandering problem when it comes to that. And then what ends up happens is, is you then have individuals who the biggest threat they're going to get is not from the other party, it's from their friend, right? And that becomes another thing that then takes place. So do we have a real problem with it? We do, and again, it's not just a Maryland issue. But do we have a, it's not, but do we have a solution? Yeah, so I, I think we do. Um, so one, I, I think if you can look at how how individual states can think differently about how they're doing their placements and how they're doing their redistricting. And each state has an opportunity every 10 years to be able to do it. I mean, I look at it right now, so I'm, I'll, I'll be, by the time I'm leaving for my second term, it'll be about the time that we're doing this. So part of my second term project is gonna be how can Maryland have a more equitable system when it comes to our congressional races and when it comes to our, our equitable financial distributions. So there are ways that individual states can do it, but you actually have to choose to do it. You actually have to choose to be transparent. You have to choose to follow the data and not just simply do it about how can you hoard or consolidate a measure of power but do something that you think is going to be in the benefit of the people for the long term. Which might not be popular, but that's why it's good to do it. <laughs> so, so, you know, I didn't go to law school, but I know one thing, um, you know, I watch TV, all the, all the law shows. Um, once you've opened the door to something, I get to question you on it, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about that second term. Yep. Um, so, you've made it, so you've made it really clear, 2024, um, you were supporting the Democratically, the Democratic president. Yep, 2028. Supporting Democratic president. 2028. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that. Um, I, I'm, I'm not. Um, I, I'm very honest. I'm not even thinking about that. And and I'm um and I'm gonna tell you and I'll tell you a big reason why. We cannot take our eye off of why 2024 is so important. I'm, I'm, so I'm gonna give you my personal opinion. Um, if we get 2024 wrong, I don't know why we're talking about 28. And and you know and and I and I say it and I know sometimes people think that it's like a, a nihilistic perspective. Um, and we can talk about what the danger of democracy is. We can talk about the the the, the challenges of the basic rule of law. Um, and I can talk about those things uh, all, all night long. But, but here's the other thing that I do think is important and why I am so uh, so enthusiastically supportive of, of, of the president and why we have to support him. Um, I think about what's happened in the state of Maryland over the past 10 months, right? Where, where in the state of Maryland, since I've been governor, we've announced over the creation of over 31,000 jobs in the state of Maryland. We've announced that we are redoing and rebuilding the Frederick Douglass Tunnel, which is going to increase access that is going to take place between Baltimore, increase high-speed rail, and also environmentally friendly transportation options between the city of Baltimore and Washington, D.C. We've just we announced in our first three months that a project that was that was that was taken offline by my predecessor, that I put it back online, something called the red line, which is the first time you're actually going to transit between east and east-west transit in the city of Baltimore. Because if you do not have economic, if you do not have physical mobility, you cannot have economic mobility, right? So we put together the red line with that back on track now to have east-west transit in Baltimore. Just in our time, we're putting $267 million 
that's going towards high speed rate uh, that's going towards wi wi-fi and broadband access because i made a pledge to the people of my state by the end of my first term i want my entire state wired with broadband and there's no reason for us not to be from western maryland to the eastern shore harper county to southern maryland everywhere in between everyone needs to have access to, even if everyone needs to have accessible and affordable broadband and wi-fi because you cannot have new technologies and new industries that are growing you cannot have where the number one way for people to get benefits to apply for jobs for educational supports is is wi-fi and we still have huge swaths of our state that do not have access to it by the end of my first term i want it done we just got an investment from the federal government 26 7 million dollars to make that happen that we are now saying that we i want maryland to be the offshore wind capital of this country that we are now putting doing elements to create new new pathways for solar and wind technologies in our state our state is moving and you know why I bring all that up? Tell me how I accomplish those things without the bipartisan infrastructure. Tell me where the money comes from to be able to make sure that Morgan State University, one of the four top HBCUs in this country that all have an existing state of Maryland, that we're doing new work around STEM technology. Tell me how that happens without the Chips and Science Act. Tell me how the work that we are doing, tell me how the work that we're doing around offshore wind and solar technologies Tell me how we accomplish that without the IRA. I mean, I believe in performance and I believe performance matters. And the reason that I am so enthusiastically supporting this president for re-election is not just because I fear the alternative, and I do fear the alternative, but it's not just because I fear the alternative. It's because look at what we've got done in the first 10 months. Imagine if you can give me another four years. Imagine what we're going to be able to pull off. Imagine if you allow us to dream and be big and invest and go after big problems and to get them done in a bipartisan way. Imagine if we can pull that off. And so the reason that I'm so enthusiastic about what that's going to bring is because I just believe very deeply, and I say this respectfully because I know I'm in, you know, not a home turf, um, but this is going to be Maryland's decade. It's going to be Maryland's time to get it right and just go faster than everybody else. But I know having the right partner in Washington, D.C. is what's going to be required. Right now. There are so many good questions here, one of which is, is related to that. But I'm going to have to end on these two questions. First of all, where are the Orioles fans in the room? Hey. Yeah, I'm getting So they want to know about the league. What's going on in Camden? I got a few questions. Oh, yeah. No, no, it's good. Um, the Orioles are going to be in Baltimore for 30 more years. Why, why I'm so excited about this is, uh, and it's not just because I'm a, I'm a huge Orioles fan, and it's not just because over the next 30 years we're going to win a bunch of World Series, which we will. Uh, and I'm sure we'll play the Phillies in some. Uh, but here's, here's what I know. You were we, doing well. <laughs> <laughs> but but here's, here's the thing. I know. Um, when I came on board, uh, there were a few guiding principles that I went in. Um, and so just for a sense of background, uh, the Orioles and, and, and the lease of where the Orioles are going to go was, was under, a bit of, under a bit of speculation and complication. Negotiations had broken down, so then I become the governor. And there were a few guidelines that I went in. As I said, we need to enter into these negotiations. One is we are not doing a short-term lease. Not in my time. We need the Orioles to sign a long-term lease and as was just mentioned, you know, that we've now come to agreement with the Orioles that the Orioles are going to be here for at least 30 more years of that. So that's one. The second thing is it's incredibly important that we be stewards of taxpayer dollars. Right? That there is there it's important that taxpayers feel a sense of confidence and that we're gonna be a steward with every single dollar, and we need to make sure that we are gonna be responsible and important stewards of taxpayer dollars. The third piece is this: while I know the Orioles are gonna win multiple world series over the next three years i am not just interested in creating winners on the field the orioles and no institution can exist and if you can have a world-class team but if the area around you is dying then what have you done what have you accomplished we have to create an environment where everybody can win not just the sports team but the area around it and so that's why, that's why everything.
that's why everything we're building together right now that's going to take place with long-term long-term deal uh with with the orioles is about making sure that yes we are going to you know they can they will spend time building up the fan experience but you know what i also care about what's going to happen to the neighborhoods around it what happens to the community are we getting our minority-owned businesses and our women-owned businesses and our veteran-owned businesses are they able to build new businesses and new opportunities and new wealth because of the amount of energy that's going on are you creating a walkable environment so that people when they come to baltimore yes they might come for a convention but they're going to go to a ball game and they're going to eat at restaurants they're going to stay at hotels can you create a an experience for people around there that is safe a place where people feel welcomed and a place where our small businesses can grow and so i'm really proud of the work that the team has done we brought in the new uh, a, a new chair of our, of our state authority who, uh, who has done a remarkable job and all three of the guidelines that we have laid out they need to be here for the long term we need to make sure we're being smart and, and good stewards of taxpayer dollars and we need to make sure we're creating winners not just on a field but winners off the field i'm really proud of the fact that in our time we're going to accomplish all three of those things and yes the world's going to win a bunch of championships <laughs> <laughs> Black um, you have some positions in the seat where you sit. Uh, as the chief executive of Maryland, where do you come down on this? Crab cakes or Smith Island cake? <laughs> <laughs> I like the question. <laughs> I'm about to say, like, listen, but one thing I believe in our state, we don't have to choose. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have crab cakes or Smith Island cake. You have to choose the best one. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Maryland Governor.